Welcome to the second of four Physics 30 review videos. In this video we'll be looking at Unit B, Forces and Fields. In this unit we had a closer look at electricity and magnetism. The first two-thirds of the unit dealt with electric forces and fields. Here are the important equations on your formula sheet. So the first equation is Coulomb's Law. The next is the electric field of a source charge Q. That one is another expression for the electric field of a source charge Q. It's just a rewrite of the above. That one is for the electric field of a parallel plate capacitor. That is the electric potential. And the last one is the current. So please note the difference between delta E, which is the electric potential energy, and that E, which is the electric field vector. So the last third of the unit dealt with magnetism. The first equation there shows the force on a current carrying conductor. That one shows the force on a charge moving through a magnetic field. Let's focus our attention on electric forces. So electrostatics is the study of electric charges at rest. The first written account that we know of came from Thales of Miletus. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. He noted an attraction after lodestone and amber were rubbed together. Interestingly, elector, an early Greek word for the sun, was used to describe amber. It's not too much of a jump from there to get to the word electricity, something many of us take for granted nowadays to light up our homes and power our devices. All of this had its origin from a bit of fossilized tree resin. Maybe one day we'll finally get dinosaur parks from it as well. The triboelectric series gives us a list of materials in order of their affinity for electrons. Materials towards the negative side are more electron greedy and are very good at taking electrons. Towards the positive end of things are more electron indifferent and are sort of happy to give theirs up. So we can relate these materials with their electrons to dogs and sticks. Some dogs are just better at getting sticks than others. So when two dogs meet, in order for one dog to gain a stick, another dog has to give one of theirs up. A material can accumulate a number of sticks, or electrons, and build up a large negative charge. And some dogs seem more than happy to share. Coulomb's law tells us how strongly charges attract or repel one another. It's an inverse square law, much like what Newton found with gravity. No need to include the signs of the charges in this formula. It's probably easiest just to work out the force direction afterward. Opposites attract, likes repel. Okay, on to fields next. Not those kind of fields, electric fields. So the idea of action at a distance is sort of an uncomfortable one. It's hard to wrap your brain around some charge affecting some other charge without them actually touching. So this is where the concept of an electric field helps out. It gives you an idea of what will happen if you put some arbitrary charge at a certain position in space. It might help to think of an electric field as a bucket brigade communicating to other nearby charges. Electric field lines show us what direction a positive test charge would move when placed near one or more source charges. A negative test charge would move in the opposite direction. The electric field is stronger in areas where the field lines are closer together. Electric potential energy is a bit like gravitational potential energy, but gravity is only capable of attraction. So we really only gain gravitational potential energy if we were to lift a boulder further from the Earth's center. In a similar situation set up with electric charges, if we took a positive and a negative charge and we separated them, we would need to put some work in to make this happen, much like we would need if we lifted a boulder up a mountain. So this work we put in gets stored as electric potential energy. Now with electric charges, we can have two charges repelling one another, unlike gravity. So if we took two like charges, to both positives for example, and brought them closer together, we would need to put some work in to make this happen. So this shows up as stored electric potential energy. Electric potential gives us an idea of what electric potential energy is possible if we stuck some charge at a certain position in space. It's sort of like knowing what the shape of a slide is and leaving the energy calculation for later until we know exactly who's on the slide. So if we take the formula for gravitational potential energy and remove any specific reference to mass, that's what gravitational potential is. So the nice thing about this is that we're mostly done our energy calculation before anyone even steps on the slide. So at any one of these positions, we could tell you pretty quickly what someone's energy would be. You won't have to know about gravitational potential in this course, but hopefully it will give you some insight into how electric potential works. That's the equation for gravitational potential, by the way. That funny symbol is a phi. You will need to know electric potential, though. So electric potential is defined as the electric potential energy per unit charge. 
So it's written on your formula sheet as delta V equals delta E over Q. Please remember that this E is for energy and not the electric field vector. Parallel plate capacitors have a very consistent electric field in between them. Near their outer edges it gets a bit wonky, but we won't have to worry about that in this course. We're given this relationship between electric field and electric potential on your formula sheet. So this one applies to parallel plates where D is the plate separation. We can think of the electric potential between parallel plates as a nice wide gradual slide where the top of the slide is the positive plate and the bottom of the slide is the negative plate. You may see conservation of energy questions come up like the one on the left here. This question is almost exactly like a projectile motion problem where the electron drops from a region of higher potential energy to a region of lower potential energy. Remember to keep the x and y information separate. There is only acceleration in the y direction, none in the x. The final portion of unit B deals with magnetic forces and fields. We can use the concept of a field to help explain action at a distance. You can think of a magnetic field as a bucket brigade communicating to nearby charges and magnets. Magnetic field lines originate in the north and terminate in the south. The lines are closer together where the field is stronger. There are a bunch of right-hand rules in this unit. The one shown here on the right gives us the magnetic field for a straight current carrying wire. Simply point your thumb in the direction of the positive conventional current and your fingers will curl in the direction of the magnetic field. If it's a negative current, the magnetic field points in the opposite direction. The next right hand rule, if you have a coil of wire, curl your fingers in the direction of the positive current, your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field. For the next right hand rule, if you have a moving positive charge in a magnetic field, point your thumb in the direction of the charge movement, fingers will point in the direction of the magnetic field, your palm will give the direction of the magnetic force. The force will be in the opposite direction if it's a negative charge. The final right hand rule tells us what will happen to current carrying conductors in magnetic fields. Simply point your thumb in the direction of the positive conventional current, your fingers in the direction of the magnetic field, your palm will give the direction of the magnetic force. The force will be in the opposite direction if it's a negative current. This is the first equation for magnetic force on your formula sheet. This is for a length of wire L with current I. The other is for a charge Q moving at speed V. So electric motors are a neat application of the above rules and equations. Uh, I'd encourage you to check out page 608 of your textbook for a closer look. Let's get into some examples. All right, here we've got an example applying Coulomb's law. We've got two charged spheres separated by a certain distance, attracted to each other with a force of 10 newtons, question is what is the force uh, for situation the charge on both spheres is doubled the separation distance is halved so we've got Coulomb's law we'll let R be a certain distance just unspecified Q1 be some unknown charge Q2 be some other unknown charge and if we see K Q1 Q2 over R squared that's 10 newtons so in the new situation we got F is K times 2 Q1 times 2q2, they're both doubled, all over half the separation distance, so half r square that whole thing. So that equals 4 times kq1 q2 all over 1 quarter, and then just separate that out, r squared. So we've already squared the half. So 4 divided by a quarter is 16, and then kq1 q2 over r squared. So that looks like the original force, uh, that's 10 newtons, so kq1 q2 over r squared is 10 newtons. So 16 times 10 newtons gives us 160 newtons, so that will give us 1.6 times 10 to the 2 newtons uh, with the appropriate sig digs, because yeah, that's probably the best way to express the final answer, I think. Okay, next situation. The charge on one sphere is doubled, the charge on the other sphere is tripled, the separation distance is tripled. So the new force we'll see is K times twice the first charge times three times the second charge all over 
3 times the separation distance initial, square it, so that gives us 6 kq1 q2 all over 9 r squared. 6 over 9 reduces to 2 over 3, you get kq1 q2 over r squared, so that looks like 2 thirds times the original force, which was 10 newtons. So 2 thirds times 10 newtons gives us 6.7 newtons. And that's it. We're done. Another example, we've got a magnetic field used to bend a beam of protons, kind of like that one. What uniform magnetic field is required to bend a beam of protons moving at 1.2 times 10 to the 6 meters per second in a circular arc of 0.25 meters? So we'll start out, draw a circle. The protons will go in a circular fashion with a radius of 0.25 meters. They're going to speed along with uh, 1.2 times 10 to the 6 meter per second and we want to find out what the magnetic field is to do that. So we'll need the magnetic field providing the centripetal force. If something's moving in a circle, there's a centripetal force. Remember the formula for that is mv squared over r, and the magnetic force formula is qvb for charges moving in a magnetic field. So we'll let mv squared over r equal qvb, and see what we got here. We've got V, we've got R, and we've got V again on the right. Okay, uh, we can find M from our formula sheets, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms for a proton, and Q also on our formula sheets is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, also for a proton. So what do we do next? find B. So let's plug in our values, 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, multiply by the speed of the proton squared, don't forget to square it, all over 0.25 meters. Let that equal 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, times the speed, 1.2 times 10 to the 6 meter per second, times B. All right, we'll just uh, make a bit of room here. Shrink that down, shift that up, and let's figure out what the left side is. 9.6 10 to the minus 15 newtons equals 1.9 10 to the minus 13 coulomb meter per second multiplied by B. Divide the left by the right side, you get 0 0.0501 kilogram per coulomb seconds. That gives you that B is 50 millitesla. And that's it.